Spider-Man swings his way back into cinemas this weekend in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. This is the eagerly awaited sequel to the Academy Award winning Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, a movie that not only introduced moviegoer to Miles Morales, but showed us that he was just as capable as the various Peter Parkers that came before him. And like any good sequel worth its salt, this one sets out to expand on the titular Spider-Verse while giving fans more of what they really loved about the first film. But does it manage to achieve either of those two goals, or has it perhaps grown too big for its own good? Hi guys, Michael Abayemi here, and today, I'm reviewing Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. The film is set a year and a half after the events of the previous one, with Miles still struggling to juggle between schoolwork and his duties as a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. In that time, he has amassed his very own rogues gallery of villains, as well as some notoriety. He is soon sucked into a brand new multiverse spanning adventure with a fresh cast of spider people, along with some returning favorites. And with a new arch nemesis hellbent to revenge to contend with, Miles will quickly find out that he needs all the help that he can get. My expectations heading into Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse were about as high as you can imagine, being the massive Spider-Man fan that I am. The first film had immediately won me over with his uniquely beautiful animation style, which sought to replicate the look and feel of a comic book within a three-dimensional space. But it was his heartfelt story and great characterization that ultimately made it one of my favorite films of 2018, long before it went on to win the Oscar for Best Animated Feature Film. And since then, Spider-Man fans have been treated to gem after gem across the various entertainment media, with games like Spider-Man Miles Morales and live-action movies like the two most recent ones in the MCU. But just when I thought things had gotten as good as they could get in Spider-Man No Way Home, the crew at Sony Animation scoffed and asked us to hold their beer. Because you have to believe that I am not being hyperbolic when I say that this is now possibly my favorite Spider-Man movie of all time. That's high praise indeed, considering that Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 had held the title of my favorite comic book movie since its release in 2004. And much like that movie had managed to take its predecessor to the next level, this one shoots everything that came before it into the stratosphere. The animation is just as vibrant as it was in the first film, with each variant of Spider-Man giving their own unique animation style. This extends to the worlds they inhabit as well, with each one sporting a distinct look and feel. It would appear like we've been inundated by a heavy dose of multiversal adventures lately, between the MCU's recent movies and the impending release of the DCU's The Flash. But nowhere has the multiverse been as clear and as fully realized as it is here, not even in the best picture winning everything everywhere all at once. But the real highlight in my opinion is once again the stellar characterization. Miles is as fully formed as he has ever been and we get to watch him grow even further into his Spider-Man sized shoes. We also gain new insights into Gwen Stacy's backstory with the film spending a significant portion of his runtime fleshing out her character. The same holds true for several new characters like Miguel O'Hara and the Spot, although fans of the first film might wonder what happened to the likes of Penny Parker and Peter Parker. But at least they'll get to instead witness Peter Parker's car in all his glory. And no, I'm not making that up. Another highlight worth mentioning is the curated soundtrack by Metro Boomin, several songs from which could be heard playing throughout the film. The one that stuck out to me the most was Mona Lisa by Dominic Fike, with his air one melodies fitting the joyous thrill of watching both Miles and Gwen swing through New York City like a glove. The only real criticism I can give to Across the Spider-Verse is the fact that it ends on a cliffhanger, as it sets the stage for what is sure to be an epic conclusion in Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse next year. Its extended runtime also keeps the movie from feeling as punchy and precise as its predecessor, even though it does manage to cram in a lot of characterization and world building into that time, not to mention the countless easter eggs that are sure to have die-hard fans going back to watch the movie over and over again. It's a great time to be a Spider-Man fan, and nowhere is that more evident than in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. The film serves as another celebration of the web slinger's storied history, even as it attempts to tie it all together in its very ambitious narrative web. That it largely succeeds, while doing so, speaks to a deep understanding of the superhero and his various iterations, as well as the mastery of the art of storytelling by all those involved in crafting the film. This is the Spider-Man film to rule all Spider-Man films, and one can only wonder where they could possibly take things next. I'll give the film a 10 out of 10. What did you think of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse? Let me know in the comment section down below. I'll also be reviewing The Flash soon. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel with notifications turned on if you like to see that review as soon as it drops. And until the next one, this is Michael, signing off.